Coming in at number five, we've got SCP-469. When you picture an angel, what comes to mind? Radiant white wings, maybe packed with beautiful feathers, flowing robes, a halo? All classic iconography associated with the heralds of God. However, we're gonna focus specifically on those wings and feathers for this SCP, because it seems that whatever the hell it is, it might just be an angel. But it also causes all sorts of horrific problems and is quite the pain in the rear to deal with. Known as the many-winged angel, among other things, this SCP is a gargantuan mound of avian wings, each covered with white glossy feathers. All these wings are curled into a ball that weighs a few tons and is difficult to move around. The wings come in all shapes and sizes, from very tiny to extremely large, and they all sprout off one another in a fractal-like pattern. To make matters even wilder, all the wings have a strange, flexible bone structure that allows them to move quite fluidly, almost like snakes. This can be used for offensive and defensive capabilities, but does not prevent it from flying. At the center of it all, there is a curled up humanoid body. However, nobody's been able to study this body very effectively, as getting to the center of all the wings is a difficult task indeed. Plus, there's the whole feeding thing. 469 subsists on sound waves and will do whatever it can to generate plenty of noise to consume. It uses this sound-based nourishment to grow even more wings. Its main way of doing this is to grab anyone and anything that comes too close and draw them into the mass of wings. These feathers might appear soft, but they're actually sharp as hell and contain some sort of stimulant that prevents people from passing out. They'll be pierced by these thousands of sharp feathers and kept from going unconscious so that this many winged angel can feed on their screams of pain. How pleasant. As of right now, the Foundation has been unable to conjure up any effective method of dealing with 469. Flamethrowers give off enough heat to let it replace any wings that may have been burned away, and getting in close has been written off after the loss of a few Foundation staff. They're considering acid immersion these days. Coming in at number 4, we've got SCP-4026. Now I don't know if I can classify this one as scary, maybe spooky, maybe a little paranormal, maybe something that you can make into a feel-good movie that sticks with audiences for years, who knows. But we're all familiar with the idea of a guardian angel, yeah? You know, something watching over you, or people in general, waiting for a moment to step in and give you a little serendipity, some saving grace maybe? It can't happen every time, but it happens to folks often enough that they remember it and share their experiences. Well, this is a guardian angel who watches over a specific spot and prevents people from making potentially perilous decisions. It appears along a cliff near Sussex, England. Whenever someone comes within five minutes of the drop, the people in question have to be experiencing some sort of life-ending ideation and planning on using the cliff to end it. When they appear here, they are approached by 4026, who seems to have a cognito hazardous effect on those who show up. After coming in contact with this SCP, they cite having a change of heart after feeling a bunch of negative emotions and possibly even some disgust at what they are planning to do. However, they won't be able to explain why they had said change of heart or what the guardian angel looks like. Unfortunately, things have taken a turn for the worse. You see, this guardian angel goes about his duties in an odd fashion. He doesn't tell people that life is worth living or that they'll receive some sort of benefit for staying alive. He eggs them on and says he likes to watch. This is usually enough to weird out the potential jumpers and send them back home to re evaluate. There's an incident log in the file that details one potential jumper getting violently upset with the prospect of his fall being entertainment, and then shoves the guardian angel off the cliff. Nobody's encountered the SCP since. Coming in at number 3, we've got SCP-861. Our first two angels today were rooted in modern pop mythology. Angels with halos and wings have more to do with non-secular greeting cards and chicken soup style movies than the actual bible, and guardian angels are similarly modern inventions. Not all angels are humanoids though. If you watched our extensive series on angels and demons, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, don't worry though, I've got a little crash course for you. A lot of angels are unspeakable in form and often take on shapes such as fiery wheels or chimeric beasts, or an 861's case, a mass of regenerating liquid. It can move around on its own through unknown means and is often emitting a heatless flame that changes color often. Anyone who stands within 30 meters of this entity will hear some sort of continuous vocalization, kind of like a song. The language it's sung in can't be pinned down, but those who are exposed to it in person will claim to understand bits of it. If an arrogant or otherwise unsavory individual approaches the SCP, it will initiate a choir event, which basically means that the liquid takes over the person's body and forces it into a variety of different forms. It should be noted that the songs sung by 861 appear to be Abrahamic in nature, often referencing showing people the light, burning rings, and of course, fallen angels. Makes sense, considering the fact that this SCP is known as the fallen angel. Coming in at number 2, we've got SCP-1846. If you're not a religious individual, you might find the idea of angels sort of corny. That's a really funny joke, stick around to figure out why. 1846 is a 50 something male humanoid whose entire body is covered in corn. The corn does not photosynthesize, nor does it consume nutrients. Indeed, the corn is purely ornamental. 
Additionally, 1846 can survive and in fact thrive on a diet of exclusively corn. Any other diet will result in malnutrition. Any corn plants that are touched by 1846 will grow bigger, stronger, and more lastingly than the average specimen. Oddly enough, there's a force constantly trying to pull 1846 into the sky. Upon asking the corn man about this, the foundation learned quite a bit. Apparently, he is a corn angel sent down to earth by the god Sakurbatov. Spelt S R Q N A B O T F. At one point, there was a bit of a rapture as this god was ready to wipe the slate clean. All of the angels, like the corn angel, were brought back up into the sky. However, 1846 decided to try and stick around a little while longer to keep humanity on its feet. It seems that Sakurnabudov doesn't quite understand how man made materials work, so he's very slowly making progress and pulling 1846 up. Thankfully, the foundation has put some measures in place to keep our corn angel on the surface, making corn better, and preventing a corn based apocalypse. His advice to us in the face of impending doom? Eat more corn, grow more corn, become very familiar with corn. The afterlife, apparently, is very corn centric. And finally at number one we've got Dr. Clef's proposal. One of the most famous and well regarded 001 proposals, Dr. Clef's proposal sets out a terrifying fiery being seemingly awaiting the rapture. No corn, no liquids, no feathery wings. We're talking about an enormous being made of fire wielding a gargantuan blade giving out directives to those who come too close. We're all waiting to see what happens next. Nobody's quite sure which faith can claim this angel or what it might do, although I suppose we can all assume that the impure will be cleansed. Who knows, maybe we're all impure. Messages from the future have been intercepted, seemingly from when the world ends. Folks are engrossed by the rapture, singing its praises and generally being overwhelmed. Are you ready for that kind of experience? Well, if we take this entry as truth, I don't think anybody is. Start learning those heavenly choir tunes, folks. It's gonna be a bumpy ride if these are the angels we're gonna look out for. Not necessarily on our side and more fallible than we imagined, and of course, jam packed with horror. What a world. I, for one, am perfectly content doing just what I'm doing at this point. I'll see what happens. Number five on this list is from the three angels. This story comes from the Bible and accounts for three angels giving messages for last day Christians. More specifically than the three angels as a whole, we're going to be looking at the second angel out of the trio. It is written that the second angel out of the group comes down and says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now this is a tad bit confusing, so we have to break this down a little bit. Babylon back in the day was a city where some of the most influential empires ruled. However, I do not believe that this angel is actually referencing the physical place of Babylon. In the Bible, the word Babylon was connected to the Hebrew word Balal, which means to confound. Therefore, in this text, the use of the word is referring to Christians that have teachings not based on the word of God or that are confounding. The angel says that she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication. The wine is supposed to represent these teachings that are not based on the word of God. And since we are fornicating with these ideas, humans are taking them and making their own churches based on those ideas. Now I know, it's a lot. Now this warning isn't necessarily about impending doom. However, I suppose it depends on what your point of view is. If you are a devout Christian or literally God himself, then to hear that people are making up falsehoods is pretty damning. Number four on this list is the story of Noah's Ark, a story I'm sure that most of you are familiar with. Noah was tasked with building a great ark to house his family and a pair of all land dwelling animals. In the Bible, it says that God was displeased with what the world had come to. In fact, I quote, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Except from my research, this isn't 100% true. Many experts believe it was actually the archangel Uriel who was said to have delivered this message to Noah. God sent Uriel down to earth to warn Noah about what he intended to do and deliver him with his mission of building an ark. Noah took this information and then, as we know, followed suit by collecting a pair of every single land dwelling animal on earth and building what we've come to realize would have been a 510 foot long ark. 
God proceeded to wipe the earth clean with a deluge and rid it of all of its past sins. For anyone that isn't Noah though, that would have felt like some pretty serious impending doom. Considering I would have watched my home get completely flooded with water and drowned to death with the rest of my people and family. Number three on this list is a very similar story to that of Noah. It is the story of Deucalion. Deucalion was the son of Prometheus, who was a supreme trickster and also a god of fire. Now, to fully understand why this entry qualifies, we need to ask the question Does Greek mythology even have angels? The answer is yes. And they are no different than the gods. Back then, many of the gods had the titles of Angelos, because Angelos to the ancient Greeks meant something slightly different than it does to us today. Back then, the word angel simply meant messenger without any other qualifications attached to it. Today, we have a very specific image of something with supernatural abilities and potentially a tie to God. Therefore, with all of that being considered, Prometheus even though he is considered a god, would have also been considered an angel to the ancient Greeks if he were to deliver a message, which in this story, he does. The message or warning, as I should say, is to his son I previously mentioned, Deucalion. He warns him that Zeus has become angered and intends to completely flood the area, moving the world on from the Bronze Age. Deucalion, along with his wife, built a chest. Not an ark this time, it was a chest, and it didn't have to be 510 feet either. This chest only housed the two of them and protected them from the torrential rains and flooding that Zeus unleashed for nine days. After the nine days of Zeus's wrath, the rain stopped and the boat landed ashore. It was then up to Deucalion and his wife to repopulate the earth with the help, guidance, and magical ability of an oracle. If the legend holds true, then if Prometheus hadn't have warned Deucalion of the oncoming onslaught, then all human life would have perished at the hands of an angry Zeus. Number two on this list is the destructive story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were two ancient cities written in the Bible that were disobeying the word of God. The Bible reads, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. Now God's not the type of guy that you want to mess around with. He had decided that he was going to destroy these two cities for disobeying him and sinning. Now an angel heard about this and wanted to try and spare these people. He pleaded with God and had him agree that if he were to find 10 worthy individuals in the city of Sodom, then the entire city was to be spared. God agreed to this and two angels were sent down to earth to find these worthy and kind 10 people. When they got to the city of Sodom, Lot, the gatekeeper, invited these travelers into his home to feed and house them. He was completely unaware that they were angels and was doing this out of pure kindness. However, when the travelers arrived at Lot's house, the people of Sodom wanted to, well, they wanted to get it on with the travelers. One of the main sins of the city of Sodom was their deep ties to homosexuality. And back then, God considered this to be a sin against his word, and he wasn't happy about it. Anyways, Lot refused to hand the travelers over to the people of Sodom, but the group refused to leave. This sadly led the angels to believe that finding those 10 people in this city would be impossible and that the entire city was ultimately to be destroyed. Lot and his family though were saved by the angels and flown to safety. I suppose that this story is less of a warning of impending doom than it is to try and help stop the impending doom. But considering an entire city got completely annihilated, I felt like it needed to be included. Number one on this list is Moros. Moros is the god of doom, and if we stick with our previous assumption of what classifies as an angel in Greek mythology, then Moros will fit the bill. Unlike all of our other friendly angels though, Moros was ultimately evil at his core. He was born to Nyx, the primordial goddess of the night, and his father was Erebus the primordial god of darkness. 
It's no wonder that he became the god of doom when your parents are the god of darkness and the god of the night. Now, Moros, unlike the other angels on this list, is a shapeless being and appears more as a shadow and manifestation of darkness than anything else. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, god of doom, son of darkness, all of that, why did this guy warn people about impending doom? Well, I suppose it was less of a warning and more of just an FYI. You see, Moros even though he is referred to as the god of doom, is often called the god of impending doom. He knew your fate before you knew it. For him, it was written in stone and it was destiny. What he would often do is tell people in advance about their impending doom, effectively warning them as to what is about to happen to them and how they are going to die. If these people were to try and escape their fate, then they would intervene with destiny, which would apparently cause greater chaos across the world. It was said that even Zeus was scared of our angel of impending doom because he realized that even he could not interfere with destiny. So rather than give one warning of impending doom, Moros gave hundreds of them. The problem was that you couldn't really do anything about it that wouldn't cause more harm. There is one or two cases of people actually subverting their destiny and escaping his warning, but for the large majority, this meant game over. Coming in at number five, we have Samyaza. Demonic entities on their own are scary enough, but can you imagine the guy who led a whole army of them? In the Book of Enoch, an ancient apocalyptic religious text, we see the rise and fall of Samyaza. He stood at the head of a powerful army of angelic beings called the Watchers. As son of God, they were sent to Earth to watch over the humans. The catch, however, is that they were strictly forbidden to interact with us mere mortals. With Samyara as their leader, he was given God's full trust to fulfill their duties. Things didn't exactly go as planned and the earth was almost destroyed because of it. The Watchers, realizing how beautiful the daughters of men were, couldn't keep it in their pants and decided to select wives to bear their children. Samyaza at first condemned these actions, saying the consequences simply weren't worth it. However, he gave in to lust and was persuaded to join them in the seduction of women, breaking the one rule given by God. This could be seen as the ultimate betrayal, cue the almost end of the world. It is said that the women gave birth to unimaginable creatures, bloodthirsty giants who turned on mankind to devour their flesh, leaving the earth on the brink of destruction. To return order to humanity, God sent down the archangels and condemned Samyaza into the fiery depths of the earth to burn for eternity in hell. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really helps us out a lot. Come in at number four, we have Gadriel. In the fourth spot is Gadriel, a fallen angel who's said to be the source of death for many humans, according to the Book of Enoch. Traditionally, in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve shows Satan as a serpent who seduces Eve into eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. However, in the Book of Enoch, it's actually Gadriel who appears as the snake, screwing over mankind for eternity. As if that wasn't enough, Gadriel is also said to have brought war to the earth. He provided deadly weapons and armor, as well as showed the people how to kill one another. Gadriel may have been an angel, but he's regarded as a demon of war, who is responsible for suffering and, of course, lots of death. Coming in at number three, we have Abaddon. Known as the Destroyer, the Angel of Abyss, and the Angel of Death, Abaddon had a hand in the most brutal and horrifying events to ever curse the earth in the Bible. Abaddon's presence is ambiguous and minimal in the Old Testament, being introduced in Revelations, which is arguably the scariest book in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, seven trumpets sounded to cue apocalyptic events to be unleashed upon Earth. The first trumpet brings devastation to the Earth, burning up the plants, trees, and grasses. The second trumpet is aimed towards the seas, turning a third of the water into blood, killing a third of the ocean's creatures and leaving a third of the ships destroyed. The third trumpet deploys a great star called Wormwood upon the Earth, poisoning a third of the planet's fresh water like rivers and lakes. The fourth trumpet attacks the sky, bringing darkness to the third of the sun, stars and moons. God pauses the great tribulation, giving warning to all of the destruction to come. The next trumpet is the first direct attack on man, and Abaddon is at the helm of it. As the fifth trumpet sounds, a star falls from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. As the abyss opens, smoke rises and brings darkness to the air. Out of the smoke comes a sea of locusts unleashed by Abaddon to torment men with their scorpion-like tails. 
The worst part is that they were not to kill man, but simply torture them for five months. Only those with the seal of God on their foreheads were safe. Abaddon is quite ambiguous in the Bible and other religious texts. He is also regarded as a place of unimaginable suffering. One thing that is consistent, however, is that he is the bringer of death and destruction. Coming in at number two is the terrifying Leviathan. Its fallen form is a combination of serpentine and a dragon-like appearance. Whether Leviathan is a beast, a demon, or an evil angel varies in the different religious texts. So for the sake of this video, we're classifying this monstrosity as a fallen angel. Leviathan's appearance is depicted differently according to each religion. However, it's also regarded as a massive sea monster. In some variations, it shows with multiple heads, razor sharp claws, menacing teeth with body armor made of scales, and even the ability to breathe fire. Its mouth, sometimes referred to as Hell Mouth, is often shown as the entrance to hell. It kind of makes being swallowed up by Moby Dick sound like a walk in the park. And for those who know me, being swallowed by a whale is quite literally my biggest fear. And these are facts. It's so unrational. Irrational. It's so irrational. In some theories, Leviathan is considered one of the princes of hell, representing the sin of envy. It also appears in the Book of Enoch, describing Leviathan as a female monster who rules over the abyss of the deep seas. Fallen angel or not, the Leviathan is a beast you do not want to encounter. And lastly, coming in at number one, we have Lucifer, of course. He was the first fallen angel. He's the most infamous, the personification of all that is evil, and also sometimes known as Satan himself. How could we not put Lucifer in the top spot? In Christianity, many people believe that the devil was once a beautiful angel named Lucifer, who rebelled from God and fell from grace. Lucifer was living the high life in heaven, but became overly impressed with his own beauty, power, and intelligence. His ego made him develop feelings of envy and greed, making him resentful and desiring the same glory that belonged to God, cueing the damnation of Lucifer. He was banished from the kingdom of God, and in Luke 10, 18 in the New Testament, Jesus says that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, becoming what was known as the devil or Satan. Lucifer was the leader of the other fallen angels who were expelled from heaven. Lucifer is said to have brought sin to earth. Satan appeared as a serpent in the Garden of Eden and seduced Eve into eating forbidden fruit, thus damning mankind into an eternity of sin. Thanks a lot, Satan. Although I like sinning, I will say that. I love a good sin. Although the devil isn't explicitly described in the Bible, he's often depicted as a beastly demon. With big horns on his head and massive wings, he's essentially what you picture when you think of the word evil. He is the king of hell, a place of never-ending torment, the home to demons, and the gnashing of teeth. Kicking off our list today strong with an archangel, we are going to start with Salafiel. This angel is usually one of the less scary looking celestials, often depicted as a calm and serene person in prayer. Often Salafiel is pictured holding incense. He's often associated with prayer as is it is his specialty. So far so good. In fact, a lot of people would probably want to summon a relatively positive presence like this. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. In addition to being the angel of prayer in orthodox traditions, he's also called upon to help with other things. He is said to help people interpret dreams, which doesn't seem too bad at first until you realize what people often dream about. We are horrifying little monsters at the end of the day, so figuring out what our dreams actually mean holds a lot of potential for terror. He's also able to help people break addictions and tends to protect children, so we'll give him a pass for now. However, there are a couple things that will make you want to keep this angel at arm's length as often as possible. First, Salafiel presides over exorcisms. Getting rid of demons is all well and good, but think about all the exorcisms we've seen over the years. These are not calm and peaceful procedures, they are terrifying, torturous affairs filled with screaming and profanity and blood and bile. Like we've done videos on this channel before featuring terrible exorcisms, so we know the depths of depravity they can reach. Most of the time it would probably be better for all involved just to leave the demons in there and just hold them in. You can, you're, the, you're a vessel for demons now. So summoning Salafiel could put you and those close to you through one hell hmm, of an ordeal. If demons are afraid of this guy, you probably should be too. And one more thing before I go. Apparently he wields a holy sword with immense power and it gains even more power when more people lend him energy. So Salafiel is basically Goku and will punish you for your sins and will also rip demons from your body in horrifying rituals. Angels everyone! Coming in at number 4 we've got Metatron. Oh, no, that's one hell of a name. Don't get it twisted though, it's not a famous Decepticon. They're very different actually. Metatron has a whole lot of different definitions and 
the interpretations, so we'll do our best here to keep things simple. Feel free to shout at me in the comments with uh, your interpretation. However, when an angel is recognized by some but not others, and is also the voice of God and may or may not be the ascended version of Enoch, there's plenty to talk about. The simplest description is that Metatron is the highest of the angels, is the celestial scribe, closest to God, recording what's going on at all times. Plus, he has a very cool transformation. Apparently at some point, a mortal man had his flesh turned to flame, his veins to fire, his eyelashes to lightning, and his eyeballs to flaming torches. After all this, he was given a throne next to the throne of glory and given the heavenly name, Metatron. This is just one telling of what happened, but still. Imagine seeing something like that happening before your very eyes. This is a being that could vaporize you in the blink of an eye, no questions asked. Now, this transformation doesn't stop there. Metatron continues to be terrifying even once in heaven. Apparently, as the voice of God and the scribe angel, he's covered with one million eyes and one million mouths. These mouths all speak different languages so as to communicate with anyone, anywhere. And don't think you're getting away with anything with all those eyes trained across the world. Legendary. He's also said to be the largest angel with an enormous body rocking 36 wings. Three representing the Holy Triumvirate, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then multiplied by the 12 tribes of God's chosen people. All in all, this is an incredibly powerful, high ranking, and complex angel. So if you're gonna summon him, you'd better have a mighty good reason. And if not, you could find yourself in a whole world of trouble. If Metatron's transformation involved fire and lightning in order to ascend, what do you think he's gonna punish you with? I personally don't want to find out. Coming in at number three, we've got Lila. Now here's something truly scary, the angel of childbirth. I don't know about you, but babies are scary. Just deciding one day that you'd like to play God and bring a tiny human into this cruel world, watching as it grows inside of another human and then eventually flies out like a chest burster from alien, blood, viscera, and all. Boy, and an angel presides over that. Hmm, maybe don't summon that. She also feuds with Lilith, who tends to prefer destruction over creation. So if you're bringing Lila to the party, you're also going to end up running into Lilith, too. Whenever conception occurs, it's said that Lila speaks to God about the fate of the soon-to-be child. God then chooses the strength, appearance, and destiny of said individual, and Lila plants this seed into a mother's womb. It's awfully deterministic, don't you think? That the moment you're conceived, everything's already just laid out, and we lift it up to an angel and God with no input, no choice? It's a little much. However, there is an interpretation that changes this a bit. Some say that Lila plucks a soul from the Garden of Eden and makes it enter an embryo. There, she shows the soul all of the potential it has in life and all of the possible rewards and punishments it may endure. After this terrifying lesson slash indoctrination, she strikes it upon the lip, forming the philtrum and erasing all of its memories of these ideas. From there, it's essentially a blank slate with the ability to become righteous or wicked. But why get rid of the knowledge you already gave it? Why can't everyone be righteous? It just seems like babies are set upon a very tough path with not enough to work with. So come on, Lila, cut them some slack. Coming in number two, we've got Ramiel. There are two versions of Ramiel we can look to the Fallen Watcher and the Angel of Hope. Of course, the spookier edition has to be the Watcher, but we will briefly touch on each. As the Archangel of Hope, Ramiel is in charge of bringing folks divine visions and carrying the faithful up to heaven. Like always, I'll be doing a less than generous reading of these tasks. A lot of serial killers claim to have seen divine visions, and uh, they're meant to cleanse the world of sin. Maybe we'll leave that to actual angels and don't let mortals with knives and guns get god complexes. And carrying the faithful up to heaven, like the actual rapture? Sounds horrifying to me. Maybe that's just me, you know, the host of the scary YouTube channel and regular blasphemer, but you know, you do what you can. Now, if we want to talk about Ramiel the Watcher, there's also some spooky stuff going on. You might have noticed, we talk about these fallen angels quite often. Ramiel is the sixth of 20 leaders and brought his legions down to earth to take wives, mate with human women, and teach forbidden knowledge. He's also referred to as the Thunder of God, which is particularly terrifying and elicits images of wrath, fire, destruction, and earth-shattering noise. So tell me, do any of these visions of Ramiel sound like something you'd want summoned before you? Probably not. And if that doesn't convince you, just think about the Ramiel that shows up in Evangelion. Oh boy. And finally, at number one, we've got Gadriel. Ah, the one who started it all. Another watcher, he could be the one to blame for all of humanity's failings. That's right, no angel was just gonna head down to Earth on their own and yuck it up solo. Somebody needed to convince all of these divine beings that earthly pleasures were worth throwing their current existence away. Some say that Gadriel was the one to kickstart that whole operation. Yikes. Even worse, he might have been the one to convince Eve to partake in the forbidden fruit. He deceived her, dooming humanity to lifetimes and lifetimes of pain, suffering, and hubris. If there's an angel you don't want to summon, 
Gadriel should be topping that list for sure. Angels are a lot more complicated than most would think. They're not all goodness and light, even the ones who are totally devoted to the Almighty himself. Lots to ponder here for sure. Coming in number five, we've got Sephiroth. Not all angels have two wings. Some just have one, and that's enough to cause more trouble than probably anything else. The story of Sephiroth is a famous one indeed, as he has claimed a spot in the hallowed halls of video game fame. With his recent addition to Smash Bros, his legacy grows even larger, and now it's almost impossible to ignore him in conversations about famous video game villains. But how does he fit in this conversation about angels? Well, don't summon Sephiroth. Just don't do it. There are so many ways he can make your life living hell. Born to a morally depraved scientist and his helpless wife, Sephiroth was injected with cells from Genova, an extraterrestrial being of great power. With this power, he was able to develop into a super soldier of sorts, getting all sorts of tough tasks done for the Shinra company, and inspiring countless soldiers to be like him. The cell implant was only the beginning, as later in his life, Sephiroth began committing terrible atrocities in search of power and revenge. Learning of the experiments done to him and the fate that befell his mother, Sephiroth decided that it was time to annihilate some people. He leveled the Shinra headquarters, killing everyone inside, and who could forget the good old Nibelheim Massacre? That famous image of the silver-haired swordsman striding through an inferno. He annihilated an entire town after learning of his origins. This destructive path eventually leads him to being flung into a pool of Mako and entering the life stream, where he learned things about the universe that nobody else could possibly know. Did this make him want to become benevolent and help those who were still shrouded in darkness? No, it made him even angrier. Returning more powerful than ever, Sephiroth attempted to blow up the entire planet by bringing a meteor down upon it. Ah, simpler times. Eventually, he manifests as a terrible quasi-deity with seven wings and a penchant for destruction. Even after his defeat at the hands of Cloud, he doesn't truly disappear. His legacy is continued on by Geostigma, and his presence is still felt by many. So while not a true angel, he definitely ascended past mere humanity and became something more. And nobody should be looking to summon him anytime soon. Coming in number 4, we've got Fiore and De Blanc. Now here's an interesting duo. I'm breaking a few rules and conventions here, firstly because there's two of them, and also because these angels themselves aren't all that bad. But the thing is, if they're summoned, that means something bad has happened. And that bad thing sets a whole lot of other events in motion, eventually leading to God seemingly abdicating his throne and a man who fought during the Civil War taking over heaven. See, these are events you don't want happening, so don't summon Fiore and de Blanc, for your sake and mine. Preacher is an interesting take on religion, to say the least. We've got the Almighty disappearing from his duties, and his divine servants, meant to keep the peace and enact his will, are all more or less useless. So if you want something done, say the retrieval of a killer angel-demon hybrid who fuses with people and grants them great power, it's best not to leave it to them. But here we are. The inciting incident in Preacher, Jesse Custer fusing with Genesis and gaining the ability to make people do whatever he says, happens because these two doofuses can't do their job right. Typical angel. Is that blasphemous? Am I gonna get smited for that? Uh, I suppose all these angel videos lately have punched my ticket, might as well go with it. They kick off the series letting everyone know that God has indeed left his throne, which starts a whole array of other events. Then they can't get Genesis back to heaven, so they kinda just accept their failure. These two sorry bastards then spend all their time indulging in earthly pleasures and acting all around unangelic. Unbelievable, right? The worst bit is when you put two and two together, with both preacher and proper angelic lore. What happens when angels sleep with humans? The Nephilim. That might not be canon in preacher, but I'll make the leap for you. Here's a comprehensive guide to what happens when you summon these two ineffective angels. They mess up, they inadvertently cause all sorts of goofs, they decide to give it all up and indulge in hedonism, they sire enormous humanoid monsters that bring a world-ending flood. Hmm. They might seem harmless, but they're going to be way more trouble than they're worth. Coming in number 3, we've got Duma. Already we can see the negative implications in a name like Duma. You know, Duma. You get it. With all the angel talk we've been up to lately, I'm actually surprised it took me this long to properly bring up Supernatural. Crazy, I know, but here we are. Sure, Duma isn't like a mainline villain for very long, but she gets up to all sorts of wickedness in a relatively short period of time. Realizing that angels are dying out, she looks for other options to keep her kind alive. She realizes that capturing and enslaving a Nephilim could be the solution to her problems, and begins to search immediately. 
This brings her to Castiel, who refuses to cooperate, as the angels enslaving the Nephilim Jack could end poorly for everyone. Thus begins a long struggle between Duma and Castiel, resulting in the former taking up the throne of heaven. Her rule was one characterized by an iron fist. Usually heaven is seen as a place of peace and prosperity where everyone has their needs met and can live in paradise. Under Duma, that's not so much the case. She quickly turned it into a merciless prison where human souls were often beaten into submission. Damn. In order to keep her power, she even threatened to destroy John and Mary Winchester's shared heaven. However, that did turn out to be the wrong move, and if you know why, you know why. But yeah, unless you want to be beaten to your knees while in the paradise that is heaven, don't summon Duma. Coming in number two, we've got Merkin, Mother of Spiders. Seems less than angelic, but she's an angel all right, or maybe a demon. Boy, you better watch out around her though. She appears as an envoy with Azazel and is just the image of hideousness. Lumpy, horrifying, and with a womb full of spiders, she's more than most would be able to handle. However, she's supposedly based on a photograph titled Amor, New Mexico, 1987, so someone's gotta love her. I just don't know if that's something anyone is interested in doing. Eight-legged freaks from a fallen angel envoy doesn't sound like much fun, if you ask me. And finally, at number one, we've got Adam and Lilith. Yeah, I'm breaking the rules with doubles again, so sue me. Here we have the two top dogs when it comes to angels and Evangelion. Everyone has their favorite, or least favorite, of these celestial beings threatening humanity as we know it, but there's no denying that these two are at the head of the hierarchy. These two seeds of life are responsible for all of the life forms on Earth, with Adam creating the destructive angels and Lilith creating the humans. Their power is unmatched, and their creations will never know peace, especially during the events of Evangelion, when the angels consistently attack and destroy bastions of humanity. When your last hope against the enemy of this scale is a bunch of unstable teens in mech suits, you'd best be worried. These are not kind angels, they're not even vengeful, they're destructive like nothing else, and will not stop until everything is in pieces. Damn. We took a bit of a different approach today, but hopefully these angels are just as interesting as the traditional ones we focused on before. Fiction writers love angels in all their forms, so there's always more to discuss. 